Salam and peace. This is Imam Malik Majahid, and you're watching Muslim Network TV. We are on Galaxy 19 satellite, where perhaps you're watching us. So we are also on Muslim Network TV, Amazon Fire TV, uh, Raku, and pretty soon on Apple TV as well. And good amount of social media and network. This is a place where you hear conversation. Uh, which are informed, but not found all around the country as easily as here. So this is critical. And today I'm going to talk about something which is very close to my heart because I was just graduate fresh from the college when Afghan refugees started coming in. These young people and their professors, they came first and then came the masses four, five, six million people just across the Afghan borders in Pakistan. I went there, I saw them. I could see how honorable, how peaceful these people were, but they were devastated. Now America here and there talks about Afghanistan, but that's the longest lasting and it's still ongoing American war in our history. Nothing has been. And in part, it is facilitated by the equipment and all that, that there are fewer Americans are killed. But what is lesser known fact, which nobody dwells on it, those peaceful poor Afghans. How many are they killed? Nobody is keeping account. And the cycle of war continues. I was in January in Karachi for a family visit and car stopped on a light. And just like here, over there, a girl came. She was less than maybe eight or 10 year old and she was cleaning and I could see based on her dress and her hairstyle, that little girl is an Afghan. Yes, I checked, she was. That is the third or the fourth generation of Afghan, Afghans who are suffering as people killing each other. Now in the news is that the Russians are paying Afghans to kill Americans. The cycle of revenge. There was a time when America was paying Afghans with money, dollars, and guns, and Saudis and Pakistanis together. And I heard some other people as well killing Soviets. To discuss with us is an honorable person who is principal, who was considered a good officer. He turned bad when he resigned from the State Department. His name is Matthew Ho. Welcome to Muslim Network TV, Matthew. Salam and thank you for having me on. Matthew is a member of the advisory board of Expos Facts. In 2009, he resigned his position with the State Department in Afghanistan in protest of the escalation of Afghan war by the Obama administration. And uh, he has 12 years of experience with American wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and with the Marine Corps, also with the Department of Defense and State, a senior fellow with Center for International Policy and is a 100% disabled veteran. Uh, you have been through a lot. You are very young as compared to myself. You have gone through a lot. Uh, I, not as much, I mean, to, uh, thank you for saying that, but you know, to your point uh, in your opening comments, uh, what I have gone through is nothing compared to what the Afghans have gone through, or to what the Iraqis have gone through, or to what the Syrians have gone through, or the Pakistanis have gone through, and on and on and on. Um, we uh, th th these this world war, I guess, as you could call it, uh, began in the seventies, uh, and. Uh, has a lot to do with energy resources and oil, um, but has a lot to do with ideology and power. Uh, 
and it extends now from Mali, you know, in the west of Africa, all the way through Pakistan. Every day, people are being killed. People are being uh, made homeless. People are suffering. Say, Matthew is a thoughtful American like yourself who realized the enormity of it. I mean, people don't know the word Mali, do they? No. I mean, what's happening there is absolutely out of horizon of people. I came to know because there is an imam in Chicago mosque who is from Mali. That's how I came to know what is going on in that country. And Mali is a country used to be called Timbuktu, which has millions of handwritten manuscripts, the whole herit African heritage of literary, literary heritage, written literature is in that area. And I don't know how many of that have survived. Why our country as a country does not know? Well, I, I think that we have a narrative about our country that we are some type of exceptional nation that we are first and foremost. Um, and that's been borne out by our economic situation for at least the last 75 years since the end of the Second World War, uh, by our primacy as a uh, superpower, uh, whether it be alongside us or against the Soviet Union or by ourselves. Um, and then, you know, getting back to this idea of narrative, the mythology of the United States, uh, whether it be um, that that stems from uh, the original doctrine of discovery, which allowed Europeans to colonize and take in the name of God, uh, whatever lands they wanted to in the Western hemisphere um, to manifest destiny, which was basically an extension of that doctrine of discovery, uh, which allowed the United States to uh, 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 wage genocide against Native Americans, whether it has been white supremacy, which allowed for slavery and, of course, the, the ongoing oppression of, of people of color. Uh, you know, I mean, so there's a lot of different things that you you say, you know, why does the United States not care about the outside world? Uh, and, and, you know, it adds up to uh, we're, I mean, and there's other practical reasons, I, I, I suppose. We're, we're, we're remote. We're surrounded by oceans. Uh, there's, we're a big country itself. I, I always understood that in a sense of when you would realize how few Americans have passports compared to the rest of the world. You could understand it in the sense of, well, to go anywhere, you know, and for a long time, you didn't need a passport to go to Canada or Mexico. Uh, so there's so much you could travel to within this continent. Um, you know, but those are all excuses. Those are all rationalizations. Those are all, uh, 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 you know, really illegitimate reasons for the United States not to understand the shared humanity uh, that we we have with the rest of the world. And at the as same well time, as, you know, Americans are, you know, by and large, open heart people. When we hear, we understand, but we don't hear about it. I think uh, we will talk about it a little bit of why we don't hear that through the mainstream media, how our media uh, self-censored it or funding or whatever issues. We can touch that. But current issue came because of the uh, news that the Russians are paying Afghans or Taliban's to kill Americans. Now, this, of course, I mean, one thing I'm concerned about is that the cycle of revenge. As a Muslim, yeah. I know Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, among the earliest thing he did uh, was the, you know, this tribal sense of uh, revenge, which will continue forever. He, he he banned completely uh, that particular process and taught people to have reconciliation and common cause working with each other and came up with a written constitution to overcome that. But that tribal revenge thing seems to have transferred into nationalistic revenge thing. Uh, so why it is hard for Americans to understand that if Americans were paying uh, Afghans to kill uh, Soviets, they are turning it around, doing the same thing to us. It, it shouldn't be hard to understand. And it goes uh, back further, right? This this goes back to, if you talk to the Russians about this, they'll, say, they'll bring up the fact that the United States invaded both Western and Eastern Russia after the First World War, along with a, 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 a trove of other Western nations, to fight the Bolshevik Revolution. 
Um, and this is something that most Americans don't know. Most Americans don't know that the United States invaded Russia at the end of the First World War to stop the Russian Revolution. Um, you know, it, but the interesting thing about this idea pertaining to Afghanistan is that the reason why this got to the point with the Soviet invasion was that in 1978, 1979, the G Jimmy Carter administration, the president of the United States at the time, came up with a plan to start to fund the Islamic militant groups that were in Afghanistan because the, the, uh, the, the violence in Afghanistan had begun before the Soviet Union invaded. So by the time the Soviet Union invades in 1979, as many as 100,000 people have been killed. Most people don't realize that most people think the violence fighting the war begins when the Soviet Union invades, but actually it does not. It begins a couple of years earlier. And what the, the United States does, what, what Jimmy Carter's presidency decides to do is decides to try and by funding these militant groups in Afghanistan, the, in Afghanistan, of course, on the southern border of uh, of the Soviet Union was going to try and uh, cause so much chaos in Afghanistan that it would bait the the Soviet Union would would would, would into invading that the Soviet Union would feel that they had to invade Afghanistan in order to make Afghanistan stable so that unrest wouldn't move into the southern Soviet republics, which were also prim uh, uh, primarily Muslim or, or 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 at least a plurality Muslim. Um, and w the rationale behind that was that the United States was going to pay back the Soviet Union for the Soviet Union's support for the North Vietnamese. And that the, the United States was going to trap the Soviet Union in Afghanistan just as the United States was trapped in Vietnam. And as a plan, it did work uh, because the Soviet Union did spend almost 10 years in Afghanistan in a, a terribly costly war for them, but also too, especially for the Afghans, more than at least at least a million Afghans died, probably more, uh, and which caused this unrest and this instability that still exists today. So this notion of revenge goes back even farther than just that period in the 1980s uh, when the Soviet Union uh, was fighting in Afghanistan. This extends back to the Vietnam War. And ultimately, if you take it back far enough, it extends back to the end of the First World War. But Matthew, tell me this, so why everybody in America is surprised at this find? I mean, in, in, in Pakistan, in last uh, one or two couple of years, I heard this thing from people. Uh, of course, I had no way to research that, that uh, Russians are helping Taliban fight Americans. That was a, you know, sort of a street knowledge to be yeah. heard even by a, a visitor for a few days. So uh, why why America didn't know early enough about that? It, it, it's, I, I, again, I think it goes back to your first question, you know, that we talked a bit about, about why are we so insular in the United States? Why, why do we think ourselves so special? Why is there such or international reporting done by the United States media. But it, this really goes to show how uh, secluded, how much of a bubble the United States has been in uh, during these last 20 years of constant United States warfare. And of course, that warfare actually precedes that. But just to simplify, let's say last 20 years. Um, it, you know, so th the idea that somehow we are touched by it uh, somehow that the other side, whoever that may be, is going to fight back, uh, it comes as a surprise to many Americans. And I think that is a very good assessment of how these wars have been conducted against so many hundreds of millions of people with hardly any effect on the American public itself. And now particularly the way American warfare has evolved uh, with technology and then as well as too with the use of proxy forces, whether they be say the Shia militias in, in Iraq, the Kurdish militias in Syria, uh, the Afghan government uh, in Afghanistan, um, as well as in the technology with drones, uh, you see very little American casualties. So even now there is a less there's less awareness of the wars occurring in the United States because the United States is incurring even less cost 
in these wars than we were incurring 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, but I, I always think back to, uh, and I'm sure many people are familiar with uh, the WikiLeaks uh, video that was, or when WikiLeaks released the video of the helicopter killing those people, murdering those people on the streets of Baghdad, including a couple of, of journalists. And I remember being on television at the time on MSNBC, which is one of the major American cable news networks here, and being asked about it. And I was alongside of somebody who I disagree with frequently, but we agreed on this at the time, and he was former military as well, was the shock to us was that people were shocked about what they were seeing. Mm. In the sense of what do you think we've been doing in those countries for all these years? Mm. You know, so when a video emerges like that, when when uh, uh, details or a story emerge about people being killed in cold blood, or or or, or, or somebody fighting back, or just the, with this Russian bounty story, the unintended consequences of war, the, the intricacies, the complexities, the tentacles of it, right? Um, mm. You know, the fact that Americans are surprised about it shows how little Americans are aware That's of it so to begin true. with. That's so true. I this is Imam Malik Mujahid. I'm talking with Matthew Ho, and we'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and I'm talking with Matthew Ho. You know, when uh, you resigned in 2009, at that time, uh, <clears throat> Ambassador Holbrook was the Afghan uh, in charge of Afghanistan, special envoy perhaps uh, from America. He, you were flown in to talk to him so he could convince you to stay in. And uh, I don't know how did the meeting go, but he publicly said that you are a good officer, quote unquote. So what made you a good officer and why you turn bad? Uh, well, to answer the first question, the meeting went uh, really quite well. He actually convinced me to stay. Uh, I had a meeting with him at the Waldorf Astoria in New York, one of the big, you know, fancy New York hotels. And uh, he actually convinced me to stay, uh, uh, which I then, after uh, accepting his offer, could very persuasive man. <laughs> and uh, uh, but after a few days, I was on, I, I declined it uh, after two or three days after reflection on it because I knew ultimately that I just would have to resign again. That uh, th for me, I understood exactly how the American uh, 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 empire worked, uh, how American military worked. Uh, I understood that the Obama administration was no different than the Bush administration when it came to these issues. Um, and so uh, I think what made me a good officer in that vein was that I studied it, that I uh, took the time to learn as much as I could to, to, to really humble myself and to, to, to learn as much as I could from, um, not from other Americans, but from when I was in Iraq, from Iraqis, when I was in Afghanistan, from, from Afghans, when I've been in other parts of the world from, you know, th those people in that world and understanding that the story is not about us. The story is not about the United States. The story is about what is happening in that place. Uh, at the moment, what has led up to that moment, and what is likely to occur going forward. So um, the knowledge was the main difference. Uh, the, I, 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 I think so. I, I think so. I, I, I had a, 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 a I met a, a, I was working with a translator one time in Afghanistan, and this was in 2009, late in 2009, actually, or summer of 2009, I guess. And uh, he referenced, we had just met uh, a, a member of the Afghan government, 
And he said to me as we were leaving, he had been part of the Communist Party. And during uh, the 1970s and 1980s, there were two wings of the Communist Party in Afghanistan. And I asked him which which wing of the party was he a part of? And John, his name was John, stopped and he looked at me and he said, I've been working with Americans for more than eight years now and you're the first American who knew that there were two wings of the Afghan Communist Party. So it was like that type of, um, that type of, 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 of knowledge in the terms of the study, I think, but also to talking and wanting to know more. Um, uh, it, it, you know, so I, I think that was what Holbrook was getting at was was my earnestness in it, my uh, desire to truly understand the situation. And in Afghanistan, when I, under, when I understood the situation was no different than what the situation had been in Iraq. Again, that the Obama and that, is, uh, yeah. and that was in your uh, four page uh, resignation letter that I have lost quote, I have lost understanding of and confidence in the strategic purposes of the United States presence uh, in Afghanistan. So what was the purpose then and what is the purpose now? Well, the purpose- you didn't understood then. I, I think I really do believe that, um, I mean, if you can go back, we can go back all the way back to the 70s, right? But if you want to just, just, just for the sake of simplicity and we only have uh, uh, an hour uh, a show to do, uh, we can begin with say the George W. Bush administration and after 9-11. And I do believe that after 9-11, George W., uh, the American president felt a need for domestic political reasons to achieve revenge, to carry out justice. Um, and so the offers by the Taliban uh, to hand bin Laden over to a third country, you know, the, the offers of other nations to intercede were pushed aside because the United States, uh, what was best for the United States at that point was revenge, was vengeance, was was because that was what was best politically for the American president. And then the United States becomes involved in Afghanistan um, sees it as a triumph of Western values, of Western democracy. Because you have to remember that in the 1990s, there was uh, uh, American foreign policy was uh, buoyed by these ideas that we were at the end of history, that with the end of the Cold yeah, War. There was a book actually, end of exactly history. Exactly right, exactly right. Um, you know, and, and Francis Fukuyama uh, wrote this book called yeah. The End of History. And then uh, came this uh, clash of civilization. Exactly. Sam Huntington's. And, and those two books had a tremendous impact on the American foreign policy establishment, as well as, well as the United Kingdom and, and other places, too. But th so this idea that uh, somehow uh, the United States is policies in Afghanistan, the remaking of Afghanistan, the settling of, as Huntington would call, border areas, right? These border, these borderlands, these uncivilized parts of the world, the settling and remaking of that was very important for uh, a, a proof of concept almost. And I heard this when I was at the State Department in 2005 working on the Iraq desk, you heard people talking about this because at that point, uh, Afghanistan was viewed as a success story in 2005, whether or not it was, at least in the United States, it was being viewed as a success story. And what was being done there and this proof of concept of Western civilization uh, being spread, democracy being spread. So after this revenge, uh, this need for vengeance, comes this uh, ideal idealistic crusade. And then when what has occurred in Afghanistan, when the reality was in Afghanistan, there were two sides fighting in civil war. We took one side out of the civil war and put the other side in charge without doing anything to reconcile or to, to uh, resolve the conflict. And so the side we put in power immediately went, went after and started uh, punishing the other side, the side you know, which is primarily rural Pashtuns. Um, Tell me this, Matthew. I sorry to break your train of thought. Yeah. But a little bit moving away from. So America was there. Soviet, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, along with Pakistan and, uh, but Pakistanis um, <clears throat> claimed that they were as uh, they were as much of a victim of American warfare as they were partners. 
and their claim is 70,000 Pakistanis uh, lost their lives in American adventure in Afghanistan. Uh, when you were there, how you saw that relationship? So when I got there in 2009, um, the Pakistani Taliban, which of course is different than the Afghan Taliban, um, was uh, moving quite forcefully uh, out of the, 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 the Pashtun tribal areas and kind of heading towards um, uh, uh, the non-Pashtun parts of, of, of Pakistan to, towards Punjab. And, and then, of course, there's a big fight in the Swat Valley at that point in 2009. And so there's a lot of criticism of Pakistan because Pakistan hadn't done enough, hadn't been tough enough. And the reality was, just as you said, sir, at that point, the Pakistanis had lost a lot of people. They had I, I, in 2009. I don't know what the total would have been, but certainly in the tens of thousands of in fighting that occurred because in 2004, 2005, around at the behest of the Americans, Pakistan sends its army into the tribal areas of Western Pakistan, which had been basically autonomous areas since the creation of Pakistan, and and you know go, going back into British colonial administration. So the fighting was very intense. Uh, where I was in eastern Afghanistan at the time, I would constantly see uh, U.S. drones heading into Pakistan, as well as American commandos heading into Pakistan. Um, you know, because you'd see the helicopters just going east and you knew exactly where they were going, as well as the briefings I would have and the information I had. And the, the, but the criticisms of Pakistan were continual. Um, and lots of, uh, of, of, of pointing the finger at Pakistan, saying what was happening in Afghanistan was Pakistan's fault, uh, pointing the finger at Afghanistan, saying that if Pakistan stopped supporting the Taliban, this, this war would be over. So Pakistan uh, could do what America fails to do, right? That's right. That, that's exactly right. And in the meantime, no acknowledgement of the mass amount of casualties that were being occurred by the Pakistani army, let alone the suffering of the Pakistani people, the, the, the continued. And now here we are, uh, and I'm talking about a period of time in 2009, 11 years later, where the violence in Pakistan has, of course, ebbed and waned over the last uh, 11 years, but the suffering has been constant. And just as in so many other parts of the Muslim world, uh, it, it, it from again from Western Africa to Pakistan, you have a whole generation of children who are growing up afraid of the sky, afraid of the drones that are constantly overhead, the drones that carry uh, 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 hellfire missiles and hundred pound bombs. Um, you know, constantly afraid of them. Um, so you have a whole generation of children growing up with PTSD. Mm, Howard, uh, to, sorry to interrupt you. Mm -hmm. uh, Howard Wright uh, <clears throat> writes in his book uh, that uh, mission statement of CIA was to go kill Soviet soldiers, quote unquote. Is that how military phrases its mission statement? Of course, these are three, four letters, three, four words. But is this as direct as this? You won't find that written down. It won't be, uh, it, it will be put into jargon and it will be very wordy, uh, just like any organization that anyone else belongs to, uh, maybe even worse because the U.S. military is so big and it's so bureaucratic, uh, a mission order, or even the CIA is quite large and quite bureaucratic. Uh, a mission order would not be that concise or that simple. Uh, it would be drawn out and, and, um, However, the, the intent of it, you know, the spirit of it would have been and was exactly that in the 1980s. Uh, and they were quite proud of it, the CIA. They, again, they thought they were getting revenge on the Soviet Union for Vietnam. They thought they were doing their act an act of me, to win the Cold you War. Join the, did you join the military to take revenge? No, I joined the military in uh, January 1998 because I had been working in finance and I was bored. I was out of college. I was working for a while. I was bored. Um, and this seemed like a way to be part of something that was bigger than myself. It seemed like a way to be part of something that 
Uh, I would help. I would I'd be able to prove myself, take on a lot of responsibility as well as be part of, of history, take part in things going around the world. Uh, what did you think? Uh, you thought you're going to do accounting for the military? No, no, by no means. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because so often in the late 90s, you still had many, you still had colonels and generals in the Marine Corps, in the U.S. Marine Corps, who had been in Vietnam. And they swore up and down that the United States would never do anything like Vietnam again. Um, there was a... a, 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 a uh, a, a, Mar a Marine Corps general called Smedley Butler, who was highly decorated, the most highly decorated uh, uh, military officer in American military history, actually. And he left the Marine Corps in the 1930s after denouncing American imperialism. He, he basically said, uh, you know, all his time fighting in Central America and fighting in China and other places had just been as uh, as part of a that he was, as he said, he was a muscle man for the bankers and for Wall Street, for the financiers. Hmm. And so there was this tradition. It was, so and you went in and so you had this idea uh, uh, that somehow things were different. At that point, the, the wars in the Balkans, uh, you know, and we understand those wars now, and they weren't as straightforward as they seemed then, but it seemed as if the United States had intervened for humanitarian purposes. The idea was that the United States was uh, not going to make the mistakes of the past, then which, of course, was, was my, you, which is my I own night. No, you joined for adventurism. You you did not join. Uh, so you joined. Do you Would you think you will make the same decision now if you have to? Oh, no, absolutely not. No, no. What is your not. advice to young Muslims who might be listening to this show and thinking about joining the military? Don't give the benefit of the doubt to the military. That's what I did. I actually was very opposed to the Gulf War. Um, I, uh, it's a long story, but the, the first Gulf War, the first Iraq War in 1990, 1991, I was very opposed. I was a senior in high school, so I was 17, 18 years old. And at different times, I had different feelings towards the military. Um, and that came a lot from my religious values, my moral values. And so I was always giving the institution, the military, the American government, the benefit of the doubt, even though I was so well read in history, even though I understood what the United States was had done around the world and what the United States was doing around the world. Um, I also saw the military as a way for me, again, it was to experience things, but also for, I never thought I'd have a career in the military in terms of, of spending 25, 30 years in the military and retiring as a general, but I thought I'd have a career in the United States government where I would be a diplomat or I'd be a policy person. But, you know, my advice to people is that, uh, to young people, and I say this to all the time, there are other ways to prove yourselves. If, if you if you feel that you have to go into the military to prove yourself, you can. There are other avenues to do that. You can become a firefighter. You could you could join the Forest Service and fight wildfires. You can become a you can join the Coast Guard and save people from sinking ships. I mean, there's a lot of things out there that people can do to serve because that's part of it for a lot of people, as well as to find themselves. Um, but the, the reality is about the, the American military is it does do some things very well. Um, it takes people from around the country, people from different races, different backgrounds, and it brings them together, it teaches them skills, it gives them a lot of responsibilities. But the problem is at the end of that, it sends people around the world to kill. And that is my frustration with the United States is that we can do something like the American military whose end purpose is to kill and to, to cause mass suffering. Well, we certainly could do something a short right? break and we will talk more about that. This is Imam Malik Mujahid and I'm talking with Matthew Ho and you're watching Muslim Network TV on Gal Galaxy 19 Satellite, on uh, Amazon Fire TV, Raku, and pretty soon on Apple TV as well. We'll be right back after these messages.
Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and I'm talking with Matthew Ho. Matthew, you know, I want to understand and help our uh, <coughs> listeners, so our people who are watching us to understand a little bit of inner working. And that idea came to my mind is that Ambassador Holbrook, who we mentioned that, who tried to convince you successfully for a, for a few days to stay. He said, and I quote in Washington Post, that inside the building, bring the change inside the building than outside, quote unquote. And I don't know how you responded to him over there. Uh, you were convinced. But uh, what is the internal mechanism of State Department to have this discussion and a discourse in a way that you find out something going to happen about the knowledge you're bringing to the table? Um, so the way it works for the State Department when they have their people in countries like Afghanistan or Iraq or you know wherever is that the people are sent there for one year at a time um, and the majority of them um, never leave the embassy. I was different in a sense that I was a political officer and I was sent out to the, and I was in the provinces and so I was with the military and, and on small bases and I worked very closely with Afghan governors. I lived, actually I lived in, when I was in the south in, in, in Zabal province, I lived literally across the street from the Afghan governor and I saw him every day for lunch and dinner. And, and you know, so my proximity was different than the majority, the vast majority of Americans who were serving in Afghanistan. And I hate using the word serving who were in Afghanistan. Um, and so, and many of them don't ever even meet Afghans hmm. because the, at the embassy, there are only a handful of Afghans working there. And many people who are working different jobs on the embassy are brought in from the United States or brought in from other other countries. Wow. So, yeah, like so, Zalmi, uh, Zalmi Khalilzad type. Yeah, exactly. But not even that, but even say uh, uh, people who are uh, mechanics or people who are cooks oh. or people who are uh, drivers or uh, anything, gardeners, the people who cut the grass, uh, many times are either Americans or they are what are called TCNs, third country nationals. They come from Bangladesh, they come from uh, India, they come from Pakistan. Uh, many times, wherever the con wherever the contract is, that's where they'll come from. Because uh, the Afghans, and the same was true in Iraq, the Afghans are deemed too much of a security risk. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important for people to understand is that you can have a State Department officer, and the same goes for the military, go to Afghanistan, spend a year in Afghanistan, and never speak to an Afghan. So you have a very, what then occurs is that the people who do hear from Afghans very often are only hearing from Afghans who are on the United States payroll. So of course, what you're hearing is exactly what you, they want, they expect that they, you want to hear. And that's true again, whether it be for somebody who is, uh, you know, whatever job they're doing, it doesn't have to be intelligence because most intelligence is paid for, or a lot of intelligence is paid for. You know, it, it just just to talk about intelligence for a second, intelligence com pro can come from a different ways. One, it can come from uh, intercepting phone calls and emails and radio transmissions. It could also come from what's called human intelligence, which uh, either mostly comes from paying people for intelligence, which is, as, you, as people can imagine, just uh, gives awful results, or from torture, uh, which is routine for the Afghan government and was routine for the American government for many years and may still be, we don't know. Um, and torture, of course, d never gives, uh, torture gives the answer that you want. It doesn't give the factual correct answer, it gives the answer that the torturer wants to hear. And, and so, it, so that's all to say that the information that then comes from uh, Afghanistan, from the State Department back to Washington, D.C., is basically the information that comes from either sources that shouldn't be trusted, uh, incomplete sources, or so, or just from what Americans themselves see and observe. So the information is often very incomplete, to, to say the least. <laughs> so tell me when you're thinking of resigning, 
Uh, were there other uh, State Department people who were thinking of resigning? Yes. And the interesting thing is, so when I sent in my resignation letter and it went through the chain within Afghanistan, I was in Zabal province. And so I just had to send it to the embassy and then it went, made its way back to Washington, D.C., where Richard Holbrook saw it. Um, and then he actually sent it to Secretary Clinton, Hillary Clinton and to President Obama. And I know and I do know that President Obama did read the letter um, and it had, of course, no effect. Right. Um the but within the embassy, uh, my counterparts who were in the most violent parts of Afghanistan. So my counterparts in Kandahar, Helmand, uh, Narangar, uh, uh, Urzgan, um, uh, Nurostan, uh, they saw this letter and they wrote me. And I remember six of them agreed with me. As well as too, when I got back to the embassy, this is what was so weird. When I got back to the embassy and had to inter, I, had, I spent days with Ambassador Eikenberry, who was the American ambassador in Afghanistan. I had to meet with all different types of other officials, um, and almost all of them agreed with me. I, I heard very little dissent. And what most people said to me, who uh, what, not shouldn't say, but a lot of people said to me, was that I wish I could do what you were doing but I have two kids who are going to college soon. So this is what's called the golden handcuffs. You get to a certain point within a career in the military and intelligence and the State Department where to resign would be a financial catastrophe, where to resign would cause hardship for you and your family. Now, I was a single person. I, was, I had no children, no wife. Um, I didn't have to worry about anything like that. And so I was free to do it. But I did have a number of people who said, I wish yeah, I could do what you how were doing. But actually, how many people in the State Department throughout this longest lasting American war do you think have resigned um, because of confusion on Afghan policy? I believe I am the only one. There have been other uh, U.S. official, U U.S. State Department people who have resigned uh, over the Iraq War um, uh, when the Iraq War began in 2003, including Anne Wright, who, um, yes. yeah, I'm, I'm sure you know Anne. And, <laughs> um, and for people who don't know Anne, Anne was a colonel in the Army. She went on to become a diplomat in the United States State Department, and she was actually the when the United States reopened its, its embassy in Afghanistan in 2001, she was the deputy ambassador. She was second in charge of the embassy there, and she has been uh, all over the world, and she speaks out against the American empire quite eloquently and strongly. She's amazing. She's a hero of mine. I, I want to become Anne when I become older, I guess. But uh, um, well, If you stayed to become second in command in the embassy, you would become part Anne. Well, I mean, you know, the, the, if I had stayed, exactly, it would have, um, if I had stayed, I would have had a, 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 a career. I would be, I was quite senior for my age at the time. I had received a direct appointment into the Foreign Service. And at, at that point, I was 36 years old. And I was in a position where, yeah, I should, probably should have been 45 or 46 years old to be in that position. So I know quite well what could have occurred for me. And I have seen colleagues of mine, people who were peers of mine 10 years ago, 11 years old, 11 years ago, who stayed in, who continued to support the wars, who, who, who went along with the policies, who then, uh, you know, at the end of the Obama administration have risen to become uh quite senior people at the Pentagon or at the CIA or the State Department who have become uh, deputy assistant secretaries or assistant secretaries of defense, those kinds of things. So I know quite well, as well as too, the, the amount of money that the United States spends on these wars, the, the private opportunities, so much of these wars are sustained by private corporations, uh, wh whether they uh, provide cooks and drivers and mechanics, whether they provide bodyguards, whether they provide, uh, or whether they provide policy analysts, people who work on policy. Um, so I know full well where I would have been if I had stayed in, and I, and I never regret it. I mean, right. um, yeah, Tell I never regret it at all. That, uh, in, you mentioned somewhere that I'm not some peacenik, <laughs> pot smoking hippie who wants everyone to be in love 
Now, uh, and then you also said there are plenty of dudes who need to be killed. Uh, do you still feel the same same way or you have become one of those? I've, I've become one of those. Uh, <laughs> I have, and, you know, and it just was really, um, uh, it, it's an evolution. It, it's being exposed to things outside of what the establishment of what established interests tell you. My first surprise when I, when I dealt with the peace movement was how well informed they were, how knowledgeable they were. They knew more about these wars. They knew more about Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and now, of course, Yemen and Syria. They know more about what's happening there than nearly anyone else in this United States, I feel. They, uh, so many of the Matthew, leaders- of the Matthew, movement, wait a minute. I have never heard anyone giving such a major uh, tribute to the peace movement that they are more informed about what's happening than the people making decisions in the State Department. Absolutely, absolutely. Wow. I, the, the people who lead uh, organizations like Code Pink or Peace Action, uh, Veterans for Peace, um, these are people who have, uh, who come to this because of an understanding because they understand what the United States is doing overseas. They understand what is happening to people around the world. They understand the motivations that drive the United then, States. Then why they don't succeed? I mean, there are very few people like that. I mean, yeah. it, you know, they, their communication with America is not that high. I mean, I remember in the, uh, in the, first, in the first or the second Gulf War, marching in Chicago, tens of thousands of people. Yeah. Hardly anybody marches against war any longer. Is peace movement, anti-war movement, is a dead phenomena because you guys are peacenik and part smoking people? I think there's some of that stigma. Uh, it's I think there's some of that stigma. Uh, some of it is the way the media handles it. Uh, I think about Medea Benjamin, who is a founder of Code Pink, who has written really terrific books uh, on a variety of topics, who knows about these wars and the consequences on them better than any, anything else. She got a lot of notoriety because she interrupted Barack Obama at a speech one time asking him about the drones and the killings of the drones. And when she was interviewed by CNN about it, all they wanted to talk to her about was not about whether the drones were killing innocent people, whether this was a violation of international law, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They wanted to know why she felt compelled to be rude to the president of the United States. So the, some of it is the way the media has handled it. Some of it is because Barack Obama and the Obama presidency took the wind out of that peace movement, took the wind out of the anti-war movement. So I here's think, one of us leading the country, right? That, that's exactly right. And, you know, anyone who's poor of a left-wing organization or a democratic organization or a, uh, a you know a organization that is aligned somehow with uh, whether it's true or not with with, with the idea of the president uh, will can speak to this how membership drops how fundraising drops I belong to a think tank which is a, a, a left-wing think tank and when George Bush is in office when Donald Trump is in office money is coming in. When Barack Obama or Bill Clinton's in office, we're having trouble paying rent because wow. people. Oh, so you mean, people you, you mean we should keep Trump in office so we? Keep <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We need new computers. So uh, listen, you know. <laughs> before, before we conclude this show, Matthew, so much for coming in here, but something very personal. I mean, uh, you appreciated New York Times article about suicide has been deadlier than combat uh, for the military. I mean, you personally went through thinking every day about it. How are you feeling personally? Have you overcome those difficult times? You can never overcome it. There's a change in your brain chemistry as well as, of course, the cracking of your soul um, that occurs that can never be fully healed. So you have to manage it and you have to do, you have to live your life in a manner that is consistent with your values. What, what's occurring and there's actually just another study that came out, the New York Times Magazine, a journalist named Nick Terse uh, wrote the article about suicide in American commandos. 
And it pointed the study that the American uh, special operations uh, forces did because they're having high suicide rates among their commandos was that be a lot of it has to do with ethical and moral dilemmas. When you go to war, unjust wars, uh, and also to what we would call just wars, because we, we have seen, we see high rates of suicide in World War II veterans, and that is supposedly a just war. Um, you see these, you, you, there is uh, the, the consequences of killing, the moral effect, and this is what occurred to me after being in Iraq twice. I went to Afghanistan in 2009 as a morally broken person, and that's why a lot of why I quit, why I, I gave up, because I was morally broken. I couldn't go along with it anymore, right? And so I, I left because I knew what was happening was wrong. I could no longer lie to myself. But the consequences of that eventually lead to suicide because that moral injury, as it's called, that profound guilt, is so deep, it's so existential uh, because it's going against the, all the values that you hold as a person um, that it causes such distress that suicide becomes like, and that is in, in, in the United States government, the United States Veteran Administration has known for more than 30 years now, about 30 years now. That I, hate to, yeah. I hate yeah. to stop this conversation. I'm so thankful to you. Talking to you, I feel I'm personally becoming a better person. <laughs> May God bless you, give you good health, and you continue to be a ambassador of peace in our country. Your voice need to reach a whole lot more people. And I hope I'm happy that you spared your time uh, to talk to our audience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This is Imam Malik Mujahid. And I was talking with Matthew Ho, who has served our country on both sides, from inside and from outside as a peacemaker. You're watching Muslim Network TV on Galaxy 19 satellite, on Raku, on Amazon Fire TV. And we are always there with unique conversation, in-depth and insightful conversations. Our producer is uh, Sumaya Heather. Thank you, Sumaya and Zahra Nadim for being a backup, uh, backup producer. Peace and salam.